Number 4. Francesco Schettino Everything was going fine aboard the Costa Concordia on the first day of a Mediterranean cruise in early 2012, but that would all change just hours into the voyage. While sailing past the Italian island of Isola del Giglio, Captain Francesco Scatino disabled the ship's navigation system and deviated from its planned route to perform a sail pass salute. He claimed he had done this several times before, and people on the ship and on the shore seemed to enjoy it. Confident that he was familiar enough with the seabed to navigate by sight, Scatino steered the Concordia closer to the island for the salute. He steered too close to the shore and struck a reef consequently tearing a 160-foot gash into the ship's port side. Water began pouring into the engine room, and the chief engineer warned Scatino that there was also a 230-foot tear in the hull of the ship, and the damage was irreparable. Soon after the Concordia struck the reef, the ship lost electricity, which caused chaos amongst passengers who were already panicked after hearing the loud crash and feeling the vessel shake. Some crew members falsely told passengers that the vessel had experienced an electrical failure and that they had the situation under control. One employee even allegedly claimed that the problem had been fixed and told people to return to their cabins, even though the vessel was definitely tipping towards the port side. Finally, at some point, passengers were advised to put on life jackets. However, Scatino still hadn't given the order to abandon the ship, although it was clear to other crew members that doing so would be necessary. Recognizing the danger that the ship's 4,200 passengers and crew members were in, an officer began putting people on lifeboats, despite not receiving any orders to do so. More than an hour after the initial collision, an evacuation was officially underway, and time to save everyone on board was running extremely short, even with the help of a rescue helicopter. In a desperate attempt to save their own lives, many passengers jumped into the water and tried swimming to shore. Scatino left the Concordia while 300 people were still awaiting rescue, breaking the age-old rule that the captain should always be the last person to abandon their sinking ship. He claimed that he fell into a lifeboat when the ship teetered further onto its side and ignored the Coast Guard's order to return to the vessel, where crew members continued aiding in the evacuation. 27 passengers and 5 crew members died in the disaster, including a 5-year-old girl and her father, who fell through a hole in the ship and drowned while looking for a lifeboat with enough room for them. Numerous charges were brought against Scatino, including manslaughter, causing deaths through imprudence, negligence, and incompetence, failing to inform maritime authorities of the disaster, and not being the last person to evacuate. Dubbed Captain Coward by the media, Scatino avoided taking full responsibility for the sinking of the Concordia. He blamed his helmsman for the accident and blamed the deaths on the chaos that ensued among passengers after the crash. Prosecutors never fully determined why he acted so irresponsibly during the crisis or why he waited so long to order an evacuation. They accused the married captain of being distracted by his 26-year-old mistress, who was with him on the bridge when the crash happened. Scatina was found guilty and received a 16-year prison sentence, but managed to avoid immediately going to jail while he appealed his conviction. In the end, the ruling was upheld, and he finally realized that there was no way to avoid serving time. Several other crew members and two company officials were also charged and convicted in connection with the disaster. A cost of around $1.2 billion was needed for the operation to salvage the Concordia, which was more than three times the cost of building the ship. This disaster was one of the biggest and most expensive maritime salvage operations in history. It took over three years to refloat, move, and scrap the ship, which was finally recycled in 2017. Number 3. Yanis Avranas The cruise ship MTS Oceanos was first launched in July of 1952 and went on to operate for nearly 40 years until disaster struck in 1991. By then, much bigger cruise ships were being built, and the aging Oceanos simply couldn't compete with the newer vessels. After being delayed for several hours due to a bomb threat and dangerous weather conditions, she departed on her final voyage from East London, South Africa to Durban on August 3, 1991. On board that day were nearly 600 passengers and crew members. Conditions were not improving, but the ship was already running late, and the boat's captain, Yanis Avranas, was eager to make up for lost time. Most passengers chose to stay in their cabins as he sailed into 40-knot winds and encountered 30-foot waves. The storm only worsened as the night went on. At some point, water began leaking into the engine room, 
causing a blackout and leaving the Oceanos adrift, tilting sideways in the turbulent seas. Passengers could tell that something was seriously wrong and gathered in the lounge where they waited for someone to tell them what was going on. Guitarist Moss Hills, who was working on the ship with his wife Tracy as an entertainer, played music in an attempt to keep passengers calm. However, Hills himself became increasingly concerned as the time passed without any announcement about the severity of the situation. In the meantime, objects fell off tables and furniture slid across the lounge, while the eerily dim emergency lighting system served as a constant reminder that the ship was in danger. When Hills realized he couldn't hear the engines running, he and another performer went to explore the situation firsthand. They could tell that the engine room had flooded and that the ship was sinking. Hills tracked down the crew's director, who informed him that Captain Avranis had said they would have to abandon ship. It was the first that he or any of the passengers and other performers knew about it, and by then, several high-ranking crew members had already boarded a lifeboat and left the Oceanos. Hills and his fellow entertainers had no prior training on how to evacuate a ship, but with nobody else around, they began passing out life jackets and loading people onto lifeboats. They didn't know how to properly lower the lifeboats or how to start the engines, but they did their best as the boats swung wildly and slammed against the sinking ship on the way down. It was impossible to use lifeboats on the heavily tilted ship's port side, leaving hundreds of people stranded on the ship. Hills and several others went to the bridge, expecting to find the captain or someone qualified to take control of the emergency. When they arrived, the bridge was empty, and they realized it was just them left to deal with the disaster. The group frantically began to try to figure out how to work the radio equipment, and they managed to put out a mayday call, but were unable to provide the ship's coordinates. Two ships were nearby, but there was very little they could do to help. Now that they were finally aware of the situation, South African authorities organized an air rescue mission. In the meantime, Hills found the captain smoking near the rear of the ship and pleaded with him for help. He later told the BBC that Avranas appeared to be in a state of shock and said that helping wasn't necessary. As he and Tracy began to worry that they might not survive the ordeal, they vowed to do everything in their power to make sure at least one of them lived so their 15-year-old daughter, who was away at boarding school, wouldn't be orphaned. When the first helicopter arrived three hours later, emergency responders gave Hills, Tracy, and a few others a five-minute crash course on how to secure people to the harness that would lift them off the ship. He and his wife worked diligently to get the passengers onto the helicopters as the Oceanos continued to sink. The couple were among the last to be lifted to safety. The same couldn't be said about Captain Avranis, who boarded the helicopter while plenty of people were still waiting to be rescued. Thanks to the musician's heroic efforts, the last evacuees were rescued just 45 minutes before the Oceanos slipped beneath the waves, and everyone survived. Avranis claimed that he left the ship because he felt he could direct the rescue effort better from elsewhere. An inquiry found him and four officers guilty of negligence in their handling of the disaster, but he was never imprisoned and didn't lose his captain's license. Coming up next, another terrible captain. But first, if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons. Number 2. Michael Davidson The American cargo ship SS El Faro was on its regular run from Jacksonville, Florida to San Juan, Puerto Rico on the night of October 1, 2015. At the same time, Hurricane Joaquin was barreling through the Caribbean. After realizing that they were still in the path of the Category 3 storm after slightly altering their course, several crew members alerted Captain Michael Davidson and suggested steering further away. Unfortunately, the captain ordered them to continue along the planned course. He even made light of the situation, telling them that the massive waves and zero visibility that they were encountering were things that ship's crews in Alaska deal with on a normal day. It was later found that Davidson had been navigating based on weather data that was six hours old, which is relatively meaningless when you're dealing with a storm that can unpredictably change course at any given moment. He was unaware of the hurricane's actual position and thought he was still on course to avoid it. A crew member told Davidson that the barometric pressure was dropping, indicating that they were heading closer towards the eye of the storm. However, the captain still refused to believe it. While resting in her cabin, second mate Danielle Randolph sent an email to her mother with updates about the increasingly terrifying conditions the ship was facing. She finished the note with love to everyone, giving her mom a sinking feeling that Danielle knew she might not survive what was to come. At Davidson's direction, the crew piloted the El Faro straight into Joaquin's eye wall and encountered 20 to 30 foot high waves and sustained winds of 92 miles per hour. The ship began taking on more water than it could pump out. Cars broke free from their fittings 
and were tossed from one end of the deck to the other end, and cargo containers fell into the sea as the waves tossed the vessel around like a toy boat. Davidson tried to turn the ship right side up to level it, but El Faro ultimately lost its battle against the sea in the early morning hours after its engines lost power. Finally, the captain placed a distress call. However, by then, they were too close to sinking to await rescue, and no rescuers would have been able to reach them in time. Chilling audio of the ship's voice recorder captured the final words exchanged between Davidson and his crew before the vessel went under, and they were left entirely at the mercy of Mother Nature. He can be heard ordering everyone to put on their survival suits and life jackets and ordering them to stay together. One crew member was unable to climb up the deck and screamed, I'm a goner, as Davidson encouraged him to keep trying. The recorder captured the rumbling sound of the ship sinking as the captain said, It's time to come this way. Then, everything went silent. All 33 crew members died, and none of their remains were ever found. It was the worst U.S. maritime disaster in 30 years. The actual events leading up to the sinking were a mystery for the first few months after El Faro disappeared. It wasn't until the wreck was found at a depth of 15,000 feet near the Bahamas that authorities were able to retrieve and analyze the data recorders. An investigation found that numerous factors caused the disaster. The aging ship was 41 years old and flagged for repairs. It had a faulty scuttle and valve that blew open and caused water to flood in, and its instruments for measuring wind speed was broken. While it's unusual to challenge a captain's orders, some were left wondering why the crew wasn't more insistent on changing course when they knew that they were possibly navigating to their deaths. Davidson may have been acting under subtle pressure to stay on schedule, but investigators laid the bulk of the blame for the disaster on his failure to use updated weather information in a rapidly changing storm. He also ignored telltale signs that they were heading into the storm's eyewall, including the drop in barometric pressure and winds coming from the left. Above all, he continued with his disastrous plan even after his crew repeatedly warned him of the danger they were in. Number 1. The Captain That Wrecked the Same Boat Twice Along the reef coast surrounding the French territory of New Caledonia, there are two mysterious shipwrecks that sit roughly 45 miles apart from one another. They have been reduced to little more than rusting eyesores, but they have interesting backstories that involve a shared name and a captain who wrecked them both. The original ship was dubbed the SS Ever Prosperity, and the second ship was called the MV Ever Prosperity. The twin cargo ships were based out of the same port in Monrovia, Liberia. In 1965, the SS Ever Prosperity wrecked while under the command of a captain from Korea. Just five years later, in 1970, that same captain crashed the MV Ever Prosperity into the same reef further south along the coast, while sailing from Sydney to New Caledonia's capital, Nomea. There's little information available on the circumstances of the crashes or the captain's role in them. After making the same mistake twice, it's safe to speculate that perhaps the captain wasn't cut out for this line of work. Running two very large and expensive ships aground certainly constitutes poor seamanship, and you would think that after the first disaster, the captain would have learned from his previous mistake. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn about more of history's most reckless captains, let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.